Now we're going to consider our second order linear equation with a forcing function. Now, as always with the linear theory, there's a homogeneous part and a particular part. We've looked at how to get the homogeneous part with eigenvalues. Now we're talking about how to get the particular part. We could still convert this to the system and use the technique of variation of parameters, which we saw for systems. It's kind of messy, and for us, it's basically overkill. So instead, we're going to do something else that we did when we had first order scalar equations, and that's use the method of undetermined coefficients. Essentially, it's a method of judicious guessing based on what f is you know what xp ought to look like, and it just has some constants in it that have to be determined by the equation. Here's our first canonical example. In this case, the forcing function is a polynomial of degree 2. That tells us that x sub p must also be a generic polynomial of degree 2 with unknown coefficients. So even though the t and constant terms aren't in the original forcing, they do have to be in xp. So then we take the derivatives of xp, and we put all that and plug it into the original equation. So we get our x double prime plus 4 times x prime plus 4 times x. equals 8t squared. Now on the left, I'll regroup things by the degree in t. So first all the constant terms, and then all the linear terms. And then there's just one quadratic term. So this equation has to be an identity for all values of t. The only way that's possible is if the coefficients of, t of different powers match on both sides. So that tells us that the coefficient of t squared has to be 8. The coefficient of t on the left has to equal 0, which is the coefficient on the right. And the constant term on the left has to equal the constant term on the right, which is also 0. Now these are three linear equations and three unknowns. We could write it all in matrix style and solve it with those methods, but it's actually easy to solve by inspection. If you start from the first equation, you can find C, and then you can plug that into the second one, and that tells you B, and then put those into the other equation, and you can get A. That tells us everything we need. Now we know a particular solution of the equation. Next example, this one has a forcing function which is an exponential. And that means that xp has to have an exponential with the same exponent. So we compute its derivative and its second derivative. Put all that back into the original equation. x double prime minus 2 x prime minus 3 x equals f of t. Every term has that e to the 4 t in it, so they all cancel out. And we're just left with 5a equals 10, so that tells us a is equal to 2. And that tells us xp.
Third example, now the forcing function has a sine 2t in it. Whenever there's a sine or a cosine, xp has to have both the cosine and the sine at that frequency. Now we compute derivatives. That all goes into the original equation. Here's x double prime. plus x prime. Has to equal f of t. This has to be an identity for all values of t. That means the coefficient of the sine terms on the left have to add up to equal the coefficient of the sine term on the right. That gives us one equation with a and b. And the coefficients of the cosine on the left have to add up to equal the cosine of the coefficient of cosine on the right, which is zero. Two equations linear for two unknowns. I won't go through the steps, but you can easily solve it to get a and b. So xp has both the cosine and the sine present, even though f of t didn't have the cosine. That's true in general. Now things don't always work exactly with the way this method is being given to you. So here's another example with a cosine forcing. And again, that tells us that xp should have cosine and sine in it. And this is just like the last example. Turn the crank. And what you'll find is that a should be 1 over 1 minus omega squared, and b is 0. But obviously, that will only work if omega squared is not 1. If omega is equal to 1, and you do the substitution of this xp into the equation, what it tells you is 0 equals cosine of t. That's not possible in general. So this is the wrong xp. The reason is that for this equation at omega equals 1, the xp that I've written here is actually a homogeneous solution. So it can't serve as the particular solution with a forcing function present. There are rules for fixing this that work every time. But rather than go into those, I thought I'd just show you a cute little workaround that gets the job done in this case. Here again is the XP that we got for values of omega other than 1. Now, I can add a homogeneous solution to xp, or a multiple of a homogeneous solution, and it still remains a particular solution. Right? When I apply the operator of the equation to it, I'll still get cosine t, and then I'll get a 0 from the homogeneous part. So this is still a particular solution of the general omega problem. Now I'm going to take a limit as omega goes to 1. And if you look at this, you realize it's 0 over 0. So we can L'Hopital the thing. When you do that, remember that the variable in the limit is omega, not t. So you take the derivative with respect to omega in the numerator and in the denominator. 
let omega go to 1, we just get 1 half t sine t. Now if I go ahead and put that back into the problem, I can verify that when you put this into x double prime plus x, it does in fact give you cosine t. This really is the particular solution that we started off looking for. It just doesn't have the form that our recipe would tell us.